As Pasargad was being built, Cyrus added to his dominion one enemy kingdom after another. But Cyrus was a very different kind of king. He refused to enslave his new subjects, a revolutionary concept in the ancient world. He recognized the local validity, if you will, of different religions and beliefs, and uh, allowed those things to, to persist. In 539, Cyrus conquered Babylon, but he did not present himself as a conqueror. He presented himself as a liberator, rescuing these people from their despotic ruler. And then he did a totally unprecedented thing. He freed the Jews. The Jews had been living in Babylon in captivity ever since Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and their temple, and Cyrus freed them. Now, it could be said in hindsight or political history that Cyrus was looking for a buffer state between a hostile Egypt and his own empire. But so what? The point is, is that no one had ever done anything like this, and hardly anyone has ever done anything like it since. And subsequently, he is the only Gentile in the Bible to be referred to as Mashiach, or Messiah. As uh, one distinguished Oxford scholar once said to me, Cyrus always had a very good press. It's a, it's a very true uh, statement. Before he could launch the campaign that would make Persia the lone superpower of the ancient world, Cyrus the Great died in battle in 530 BC. He didn't live long enough to show what really he could have done outside the battlefield. So in that sense, you can compare him with Julius Caesar, who conquered, but did not live long enough, uh, he was assassinated, to put the empire that he conquered together. By the time Cyrus died, the Persian Empire had three capitals, Babylon, Susa, and Ekbatana. But he chose to be buried in the city he created, Pasargad in the tomb that mirrored the man who built it. At Cyrus's tomb, one of the aspects that shows his humility is that tomb is relatively unadorned. Very simple, very elegant. Cyrus's engineers built the tomb in the form of simple but heavy stone Western structures. They began by laying large rectangular cut stones and used ramps, pulleys, and clamps to build the tomb to its height of 36 feet. The Tomb of Cyrus is a very simple, outwardly modest monument for somebody who uh, had created the largest empire that the world had seen to that date. And it's still remarkably well preserved after 25 centuries. For 30 years, no power on earth could stand up to Cyrus the Great. Now his throne was up for grabs, creating a power vacuum that would throw the ancient world into chaos. The word paradisia in Old Persian became paradise in ancient Greek. Five thirty B.C. Cyrus the Great, the architect of the greatest empire the world had ever known, is dead. For Persia, its future now hung in the balance. Rivals and pretenders to the throne vied for power. Then a distant cousin of Cyrus, a brilliant general, rose up to assume power. When the smoke cleared, the Persian Empire was securely in his grasp. His name was Darius. And he would become arguably the greatest Persian king and one of the greatest builders of all time. Darius hit the ground running. He began by rebuilding the old capital of Susa, with grand new palaces adorned in glazed brick. Today, the magnificence of the capital Susa is even found in the Bible. When the Greeks talk about Persian palaces, for example, they routinely mention Susa. When the Old Testament book of Esther uh, talks about Persian palaces, it's Susa that they mention. But the new king of Persia wanted a ceremonial capital all his own. 518 BC, 
Darius launched one of the most ambitious construction projects of the ancient world. Located near the modern city of Shiraz, it would become known as Persepolis, or Persian city in Greek. All of the palaces rose from a vast stone platform designed to enhance the stature of the empire. The terrace square is huge, over 125,000 square meters. And he had to modify the landscape. His engineers had to come in and level out part of the area, and they had to build a retaining wall. He wanted it to be seen from a distance. That's exactly why you build up a terrace, so it could be viewed from afar. That makes it all the more grand and imposing. Persepolis was a colossal engineering challenge, with walls more than 60 feet high and 35 feet thick, and great halls featuring intricately designed columns. Thousands of architects, craftsmen, and laborers, along with tons of materials, were brought from the far reaches of the empire. Most ancient empires were built by massive armies of slave labor. But Darius, like Cyrus, believed in paying for the work that built Persia's palaces and monuments. Every worker was given his due, his or her due, because we also find women in the workforce as well. Depending on their skill, what the quality they brought to the work, they were paid accordingly. No expense was spared. Persepolis would be the signature monument of Persian power and glory. First of all, it's important to remember the origin of the Persians themselves. That is to say that these were a nomadic people. They lived in tented accommodation, and they would up their tents, move somewhere else, and plant their tents again. Now, as time went on, these tents became more and more elaborate affairs. And essentially, what we're having at Persepolis is a tent turned into stone. The Apadana is nothing more than a stone tented building. The magnificent audience hall Darius built was called the Apadana. Each of those great monumental stone pillars are inspired by the kinds of wooden pillars that upheld a beautiful um, canvas roof. But now that canvas roof has turned to beautiful cedar wood instead. So the nomadic origins of the Persians gives um, the impetus to part of their architecture, but that's not all. The city's palaces were adorned in gold and silver expensive tapestries and colorful tiles. The walls were studded with carved reliefs of peaceful depictions of visiting dignitaries from conquered lands. But Persepolis' spectacular engineering achievements extended far beyond the city walls. Its intricately designed and constructed water and drainage system were unrivaled anywhere. Before the actual soil was placed in, first, Darius's engineers constructed a drainage system, plumbing, drain pipes. These would be covered. Water was also brought in along the Kanat system. But then those drain pipes, which would drain the effluents out, those were taken underground below the surface where the visitor would never see that. Even during his most ambitious projects to enhance the empire's monuments and infrastructure, Darius never stopped expanding his empire. Under the brilliant leadership of Darius, the Persian Empire grew to staggering size. It included modern Iran and Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan, Armenia, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, parts of Central Asia, all the way to northern India. And man, this is a lot of turf. To connect the farthest reaches of the empire, Darius would launch two audacious building projects. One would stretch over 1,500 miles of the Persian Empire. The other would connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Creating gardens was held in such high esteem that the Persian kings wished to be remembered as gardeners. Under the rule of Darius the Great, the Persian Empire grew to staggering proportions. Now he wanted to consolidate and connect the far-flung parts of his great kingdom. 515 BC, Darius orders his engineers to build a massive stone highway 
one that would weave the empire together from North Africa to India. Extending over 1,500 miles of the empire, he would call it the Royal Road.